so we are um, going to take the fourth uh, panel discussion on research assessment. And uh, before um, we begin this, this panel, uh, let me just um, you know, outline briefly what, <coughs> what the purpose is. Um, for, you know, as we're all scientists, and we all deal with the metrics of measurement and analysis uh, in our own work, uh, so the question is, why do we get so hot and bothered about the assessment of our research? And of course, that's the topic of this, of this panel. Um, and as an activity, I must say research is like any other. It needs to have a currency, a, um, a funder and an enterprise that sees value in it, and a community that shares the, uh, the values that, uh, so that it can continue to support it. Uh, <clears throat> But the way we assess research has become extremely skewed and formulaic, especially when it comes to assessing individual research. Uh, we have um, you know, this whole uh, category of hot journals, and as uh, Yanyar had mentioned, uh, we have an obsession with citations, and above all, uh, we have this dreaded uh, impact factor. Uh, all these attributes have, I must say, been brought upon us by ourselves, uh, but, the whole business of research assessment has become a rather toxic uh, environment. Uh, hello. Hello. Yes, Shantila. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Jeet. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but you know I I should add that there is a huge uh, revolution on hand. Uh, well, for one, in publishing, there's an extraordinary movement to create uh, an open. Uh, era of publishing in the life sciences. Many of the other sciences have already moved to this. Physics, for example, has a very strong public uh, assessment, uh, sort of a uh, archive, uh, public sort of uh, documentation of science even before it gets reviewed. Uh, in the life sciences, you know, there's a huge movement to to engage in that. And um, and as you also heard from Reinhard, uh, there is a uh, there is a massive movement for uh, reassessment of research. Uh, of research. And in fact, this was uh, brought upon by the San Francisco Declaration on, uh, on Research Assessment uh, that was, uh, in, came into being in San Francisco uh, in December 2012. And we have the director of the, uh, of the DORA, um, uh, you know, pan, uh, the, the DORA uh, uh, um, co collaborative, if you will, uh, with us today, we have uh, Anna, uh, who is um, uh, in fact our uh, uh, one of our panelists. Uh, let me uh, briefly introduce some of our panelists to you today. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, Anna, uh, who is a um, uh, well, this is herself a PhD from Dartmouth, uh, and has been associated with the um, uh, you know with the ASCB since 2018, and joined in fact. Uh, the DORA community uh, manager and now is now the program director of, uh, of DORA. Uh, we have uh, 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 Shahid who, Jamil, who is currently the director of the Trivedi School of, Life Sci uh, of Biosciences at the Ashoka University and formerly the CEO of the, Welcome, the, uh, the DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance, um, where he served for seven you know, glorious years. Um, and has, you know, needs no uh, introduction in these times because he's been one of the most uh, public faces of science and virology on our television networks and otherwise uh, telling us about, you know, what we can do about COVID and has a deep interest in publishing, of course. We have uh, Rahul Sudhartan, who's a, in fact, a physicist, uh, but whose research interests are very much about uh, life sciences, uh, regulatory genomics um, and uh, and is in fact, uh, you know, a, uh, a member of the a faculty member right now at the Mathematical Indian Institute for Mathematical Science in Chennai. Um, uh, also uh, happens to be a postdoctoral fellow from the Rockefeller University, where Reinhard uh, was an assistant professor. Um, <clears throat> and we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, none other than our principal scientific uh, advisor to the government. Um, Vijay, um, Vijay, um, well, I guess needs absolutely no introduction, but I must say Vijay has uh, been thinking very deeply about science and its assessment 
and uh, is currently, you know, been driving the formulation of the of the uh, of the National Research uh, Council for India or the National uh, Research uh, uh, Foundation, uh, which uh, is going to be, you know, hugely instrumental in, in driving science. And so, you know, given that we have, you know, this incredible panel of people, uh, let me simply turn this over to them. Uh, I'll call upon Anna first uh, to uh, begin uh, the discussion. Um, and the discussion topics are uh, uh, outlined here. Uh, how is the, it's about DORA itself, which will then lead us to many other things. How is this declaration relevant? What are the negative impacts of the current practice of research assessment? And what are the positive, uh, possible alternatives that we can think of today? With that, um, may I invite uh, Anna? We have Rashna, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Thank you so much, Juju, for that kind inter introduction. Um, it's such an honor to be on this panel with so many esteemed colleagues. And thank you to Reinhard for setting us up for this discussion so perfectly. I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, so my part of the discussion is tasked with giving an overview of DORA, sort of, you know, what we are, how we came to be, um, and what we're doing to support change for research assessment. Um, and so DORA started out as a declaration. DORA literally stands for the Declaration on Research Assessment. But since it was published, we've really transitioned into being an active initiative. So now we see ourselves as an international initiative to advance practical and robust approaches to research assessment globally and across all scholarly disciplines. Um, but our origins, just like G2 said, really came out of the 2012 annual meeting for the American Society for Cell Biology, when, <coughs> excuse me, a group of, <coughs> uh, sorry, um, a group of editors and researchers were having a discussion about how GIF was being misused for evaluation and the consequences that that, that was having on the academic research. Uh, workforce in terms of who gets to succeed and the implications it had on the culture of research and how research was conducted. So as a result of that discussion, um, the declaration was written and published that following May. And the main points of the declaration is a call to action so that researchers are evaluated based on their own merits rather than based on the journal in which the research was published. And Reinhard just previously did a great job talking about how that can be problematic. So I won't go into those details. Um, but Dora also asks the community to really consider the value and input impact from all types of research outputs, such as data sets and protocols um, and other contributions to policy and practice, for example. So to date, more than 19,000 individuals and organizations in 145 countries have signed DORA, and that includes 25 organizations from India, such as the DBT Welcome Trust Alliance. Um, so our community of signers really have this shared aspiration to improve the ways in which researchers and research is evaluated, um, you know, and based on the principles of the declaration, that's very, very intuitive for everyone, I think. Um, but sort of this is where it gets sticky is that, you know, research assessment is what is considered to be a systems challenge. And it's a systems challenge because it involves multiple stakeholders um, that are upholding the ways in which we currently assess researchers. So that includes academic institutions and other research performing organizations, funders, publishers, libraries, and of course, researchers themselves. And so what this really means is that point interventions aren't going to be effective um, because you have to target the entire system. So what Dor has been really doing is thinking hard about shared responsibility for change um, and building communities of practice 
and developing resources that they can support institutional change, um, as well as foster dialogue between all of these stakeholders um, to really lead to the change that we want to see. And just very briefly, there are a couple of ways that we do this. So Dora has a couple funder discussion groups um, where funders can talk about new practices that they're trying, what's been working well, what hasn't, and this is limited only to um, public and private funders of researchers. Um, we also are co-creating resources with the community. So we have five design principles for academic institutions to implement new policies. Um, we also have a huge resource library on our website um, filled with tools, ideas, policy papers, um, policies themselves um, that can be used as a resource um, for institutions and academics looking to do better themselves. Um, and with that, I'll sort of wrap up on the overview of DORA, and I really look forward to the discussion ahead. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, thanks, Anna. That was, you know, really extremely insightful and a lot of, lot of material here for our uh, colleagues who have uh, joined us. Now, um, we, we, we have a small, uh, uh, unfortunately, a small problem. One of our panelists uh, has just lost power, so he, um, Shahid Jamil, might... Uh, be a little late joining us, but but um, you know since he was going to uh, he was going to start off. Uh, I was wondering if Rahul, uh, you could um, you know you could uh, lead off uh, and then. Yes, I, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I Great. think I'm the only one on this panel who's not any kind of policy maker or former funder or institutional head or anything like that, and. As Jito pointed out, I am a physicist by training, though I've basically been working with biologists um, for um, most of my time in India uh, as a PI. And I have friends and collaborators in the biology community as well as a bunch of physics colleagues. And I asked some of them for feedback and pretty much universally people agree the current system is broken in many ways um, for reasons that Reinhard and Anna also pointed out. Uh, what I want to uh, talk about is why does the system exist and uh, how do we build a system that does the same things? Um, so there are two things here, I think. Uh, one is research evaluation, but the other is as a reader, how do I decide what to read? So if you look at BioArchive, you have something like 100 papers a day now, 3,000 papers a month and nobody can read uh, even the abstracts of all those papers in some fields of science it's even worse um, so um, the reason i think that um, the stratification of journals happened is twofold one is um, the journals themselves want to um, rate themselves as the best in particular the cell nature science family but readers also want to know you know where to go if they are short of time and just want to catch up on the latest research which is why also science and nature have these uh, um, news and news type articles where they cover current research so it is a shortcut to see what people are doing and as a reader you go there first as a scientist you might like to publish there first because more people read your work. So as a scientist, it's important to publish, but it's also important to make sure people know what you're doing and uh, how else can you do it? So this is what Jitu was getting at, you know, what are the alternative systems? Um, so because uh, this whole system is so, so what is broken about the system? One thing is of course the top journals are extremely opaque. Um, the reviews, uh, uh, comments are anonymous. The editorial decisions on whether to even get a review is um, pretty arbitrary. You might have a very good paper and you send it there and they return it to you without review for reasons you don't understand. Um, and this happens to everyone, uh, not just to early career scientists, it happens at all levels. Um, and the flip side, of course, is when you do get a paper in this uh, nature science family, you get very kicked. And this is especially important for um, early career investigators and um, uh, as well as uh, especially for students and postdocs, um, you might be thinking about how to afford a job. So in theory, um, we should be moving, uh, I mean, in from every point of view, we should be moving to a system where these 
few LA journals don't have this kind of power over us. Um, um, in practice, we are very far away from that. And uh, we talk about evaluate research and not the venue, but um, just in September 2020, the UGC has a document called, it's a guidance document on good academic research practices. And it talks about seven criteria for how to select a journal for your publication. And I think number four or five out of those seven is the journal impact factor and rank. It explicitly says you should go for that. It also talks about how citation analysis is a powerful approach for um, selecting articles for literature reviews and so on. So this is completely entrenched. If you look at, uh, uh, I know that uh, the principal scientific advisor Vijay and before he became PSA, as well as after he's been talking in public and in private about how we must evaluate research by um, its uh, um, merits and not by its medium, but that's not happening. And I don't think it's going to happen soon. Um, so what we need to do is work on an ecosystem. What would that ecosystem look like? Uh, there are many individual efforts. For example, uh, Review Commons, where you submit a paper from BioArchive and seek reviews before you send it to a journal. Reviews are out in the open. What we need, I think, is something like a Google page rank where people read your work and they comment on it, upvote it, give useful reviews. They have some incentive to do that also. Maybe it's some barter system where they review your work, you review theirs. And somehow, out of this uh, masses of research that you know thousands of scientists are doing, the best ones filter up. And no system will be perfect. This can also be game. Finally, what should you as an early career scientist do? I think you have to work with the system as it is. And the reality is people look at journal impact factors. Um, people choose journals based on that. Um, some of my senior colleagues in biology openly say, this is what they do. I can give some quotes from you know, some feedback I received if there is time later. So um, unfortunately, my lesson is, you know, the people at the top should be um, worrying about how to change the system. The early career scientists should voluntarily participate in it, but not stake their career on this. Um, thanks. Thanks, uh, Rahul. Rahul, that was really, um, really, I think brings in, if you will, one of the people on the top, uh, that's Shahid. Uh, Shahid, if you could um, uh, unmute. Okay, yeah. thank you. Great. But well, I'm Hi. so glad your power is back, figuratively, yeah, power. And, figuratively and literally. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I I still have room on my uh, on my. Uh, yeah, you should uh, <laughs> shut that off because that's yeah, just, the feedback. Yeah, switch the phone off. Okay. All right. Sorry, everyone. Uh, Murphy's Law at play here. <clears throat> okay. So, um, what I thought I, I, I missed everything that Anna and uh, Rahul said. Uh, so, maybe what I'll say has already been said. Uh, <clears throat> so, I thought I'll uh, simply tell you about my experience at. Uh, the DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance. Uh, when I joined the organization in 2013, pretty much one of the first things that we did was to become signatories to DORA. <clears throat> and uh, uh, we did that because uh, the trustees, the board of, uh, of India Alliance uh, uh, felt very strongly <clears throat> that uh, uh, research assessments should be based on uh, what people do rather than where they publish. Uh, uh, so we became signatories, <clears throat> but uh, became signatories was not, uh, not enough. We actually put it in practice. And the way we did this was uh, to request our reviewers as well as our committee members uh, to not uh, pay attention to where a particular piece of work was published, but uh, look at the, the, the kind of research that was done. Uh, so we asked them to look at the research question in terms of its uh, originality and potential impact of the research. Uh, we also asked them to look at the strengths and uh, major or minor weaknesses of the proposal. Uh, 
and uh, really for the track record of the individual, uh, see, uh, you know, what uh, been the progression in their careers and uh, whether their productivity uh, has been good, but productivity not in terms of, uh, you know, the high impact cell science nature papers that they have published. Uh, the, and, and this was also implemented in the assessment of our fellows. We had a critical midterm assessment in the third year of the fellowship to see how people were doing. And we basically implemented the same thing there. Uh, the second thing which uh, we did, and we did this later when uh, publishing in BioArchive or submitting to BioArchive, MedArchive, became popular was to uh, tell our reviewers and tell our committee members that uh, if people have submitted uh, a piece of work uh, to these places, uh, they should be considered as a regular publication. Of course, we understand it's not a peer reviewed publication, but the work has been done. And so it's, it's important that uh, this is taken as their research uh, contributions. Uh, so let me just stop there, uh, and then you know maybe when there are questions, I'll be happy to answer. Shahid, uh, I mean that's you know as a as a funder, I think you you know really have set a a very uh, high um, you know uh, benchmark, and I hope that this can be taken forward. And you know like the uh, issues that we heard about the UGC, which has a far far larger problem. I mean, how can they begin to assess things in a in a manner that would be consistent with uh, evaluating research rather than uh, impact factors? So, um, with that, I mean, I think you know it'd be great if we could have views about these questions from Vijay, who you know at this point is sitting at the very top of the of the you know funding <laughs> activities in the country, and he's thinking about them. So. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jitu. Uh, it's been a um, real, you know, a pleasure listening to others preceding me. Um, I didn't catch uh, Reinhard's uh, talk, but just the last few sentences, literally. Um, and you know, the important question is about how we uh, see the value of science and how we measure it. Um, and I would recommend uh, to everyone before I start. Uh, an article uh, called What is Meaningful Research and How Should We Measure It by Sven Helmer, David Blumenthal, and Catherine Passion in Scienceometrics. Um, that's in August 9, 2020. And much of what I will say now is a paraphrasing of that article. Uh, I would add before I start that article, uh, start that paraphrasing, that we must also, when we look at how to measure science and its outcomes, we must have a, a context dependent measure of this. And therefore what works in one context will not work for India, uh, in other contexts and what we must develop something for India uh, in a manner which is fair and correct. Now, first of all, I'd like to start by saying that rather than promoting, and I'm quoting from this article I mentioned, the authors claim, and I agree here, that rather than promoting meaningful research, purely metric-based research evaluation schemes potentially lead to a dystopian reality, leaving space for creativity and intellectual initiative. And I would like to stress that you know, purely uh, metric-based evaluation. I stress purely because when science is funded by the public, uh, there is a requirement that the public be told about what is coming out of science. Now, the challenge is that when science grows to the size of huge enterprises, as they have in many countries, including India, how do we manage that? And the challenge can be articulated by a metaphor where the trains of science in each discipline or area are relatively slow moving and take a long time to reach their destination and provide great value when they do. The trains of industry, on the other hand, uh, reach their destination every quarter. And the chain, uh, trains of government and politics reach their destination every Friday evening. Um, and the 
you know, the requirements that these three different sets of trains communicate material and ideas with each other is the uh, underlying challenge. But it's a challenge which can be met. Um, and I think we should go ahead and try to do that. So the next question is that um, if metrics are to be used very carefully, um, why is research so difficult to evaluate? Uh, and the answers to that are really that when we you know, say we want to measure research uh, outcomes, there is no agreement at all on what that means. Um, is it basic or applied? Is it this or is it that? And we can argue endlessly. So for the purposes of our discussion, if we say that outcomes mean impact on our society and stimulation for creativity um, and you know, cultural uh, value and so on and so forth, if that is the broad you know, area where we are measuring, then we can see how we can, see, um, how we can uh, look at the value of research. So this contested concept, uh, therefore, means that whenever we choose metrics, we should also look at them in a context where we operationalize them in you know, national organizations and in institutions, in evaluating individuals and so on. And these, as Rahul mentioned, are prone to gaming. And therefore, there should be evaluation which depend on dynamic feedback loops which constantly see how the metrics are being looked at and how they can be addressed in a context where qualitative aspects come in substantially and not just quantity, because quantity has the danger that we conflate precision and accuracy. Now, when you do this and you see how this can be done for different fields, there are also many living examples of qualitative evaluation, uh, of high quality evaluation with combined quality and quantitative measures in many institutions all over the world. And there's much to be learned by, uh, from those institutions and including in India. And therefore we must see how we can calibrate what we do and learn from those contexts rather than only bemoan the widespread use of metrics without application of mind. Uh, and that's something which you know, we can learn in our context. There are many examples and if you have time, we'll come to that in the question. So, to summarize, instead of us solely over relying on indicators, uh, again, I quote from this article, research environments should primarily be based on trust and personal responsibility. That means the right level of abstraction, the right level of focus for evaluation of individuals, groups of individuals and outcomes is the institution, whether it's a university or the research institution, and within the research and university, the departments and divisions and so on and so forth. They have all too often become so democratized in decision making that they regress to the mean and take quantitative measures as an indication of what should be the correct way of evaluation. The result of this is those who are not performing at all are not held accountable. Those who are performing very well don't get additional resources. There's an even distribution of resources no matter how one performs. And this is our internal, uh, you know, uh, the consequence of our internal decision making. So we have abrogated the power we have as heads of department, you know, deans, directors. So don't take any discussion, uh, any, any decision which, you know, uh, alters this flat curve and then we worry about why metrics have become so dominant. It's us who are the problem, but there are solutions and examples in many places, and so we have to implement those. Thank you. Thanks, Vijay. I, I mean, that, um, that actually you know, leads um, really very uh, fluidly into the uh, next part of our, uh, uh, of our panel. Um, and in fact, that's the discussion that I would like to have between the, the panel members. Um, I mean, and and, I, and what you indicated was a, uh, you know, what a credible system and credible alternative system could look like. And you in, you did you did indicate uh, different uh, locations and contexts. So I, I uh, thought it may be uh, valuable for us to hear from Anna uh, what she is seeing from the purview of somebody who is trying to engage with this question the world over, uh, what she's seeing as various alternatives uh, emerging 
given such uh, concerns. Anna, would you? Absolutely, thank you, G2. Um, so one thing that is becoming apparent to Dora as an alternative is the introduction of a structured narrative CV format. Um, and what I mean by that is that it's, so a typical CV lists sort of publications and accolades, um, where a structured format um, that's narrative has specific questions about sort of what are your contributions to research? What are your contributions to society? That then researchers give sort of three to 500 words contextualizing the numbers or um, the list of papers. So this is, I think a good example of this comes from the Royal Society in the United Kingdom. And I can, I can drop the links in the chat after I, I discuss it so you all have the resources. Um, but they developed something called the Resume for Researchers. And so what this does is just like I said, it has sort of these four questions that can be used um, to put the list of publications into context and to think a little bit more holistically about academic achievement. Um, so a number of European funders have it taken this template and used it to adapt their own structured narrative CV format, um, such as Science Foundation Ireland, um, the um, Luxembourg National Research Council, um, NWO, which is the Dutch Research Council, and most recently, UK Research and Innovation um, is also introducing a narrative CV format. Uh, again, really sort of like contextualize um, what these contributions are, sort of your research contribution, your interactions to society. Um, I believe one of the questions is also sort of your, your sort of leadership um, and collegiality, um, which is sort of getting at that research culture piece. And I think like this, for me, this is one of the major things that I'm seeing is that like there's an attempt to sort of like balance the quantitative with the qualitative and the first step of that is finding ways to contextualize um, and really sort of broaden what the academic community thinks of as good um, by describing it um, in this way. Yeah, um, thanks Anna. I think that's, that sort of uh, uh, opens up the question to thinking about more you know, more in systemic terms, what, you know, what such a system, you know, could look like, you know, I mean, and I think coming back to what Vijay was trying to indicate, I mean, if, if one needs to begin to look at these issues from a very local perspective, but, but Vijay, you know, sitting, you know, where you are, um, and also, you know, um, trying to steer the, you know, perhaps the, the, the largest funding system for science that we might see, I mean, how do you how do you actually begin to look at this? I mean, how do you? I mean, it's a it's a you know. It, I mean, I'm not saying that there's an easy answer, but how do you begin to to contextualize this? You know, the the principal uh, problem, Jitu, is trying to see how one can control the development of a the functioning of a structure, i.e. our science, by essentially what are feed forward mechanisms saying, I will check you this way, I will check you that way, you, this is good, that is bad, and so on and so forth. Um, this is fraught uh, to fail. I mean, there's no question about that. What we need to do is to move into what is substantially a feedback mechanism, where we ask, what is the value of research in general, in science, the humanities, engineering, and so on to society. What is the time scale by which we expect them? There are many things which we've invested decades ago, which can bring value now. Uh, so what the taxpayer and parliament and government is interested in is seeing those kinds of things. Now that requires a deeper, longer term investment. 
And that evaluation should be left to institutions and groups of institutions and peers and so on and so forth. What has happened is that peer groups have abrogated that responsibility and have become post people, uh, post men or post women, who basically communicate, you know, I need a proper evaluation, this is the way to do it. Well, here you are, and you know, here are our metrics. So that result, the result of that is purely uh, assay of, you know, what is happening in these kinds of crudely um, precise terms, uh, impact factors to three decimal places or four decimal places, but no measure of, you know, what is happening. So we need, you know, discussions and measures on impact of science on society. The EU made a very good study uh, and came up with the view that, uh, you know, that investment in science uh, on scale results in several percentage GDP going up. And those are very detailed investments. And those are the kinds of uh, assessments which our ecosystem must do, rather than only state, you know, we need to increase investment. Why do we need to invest, uh, invest in science? Will that result, result in reduction in subsidies, in reduction in imports, increase in exports? Which areas will one focus on? So there needs to be an engagement between scientists and economists to solve those problems, separate from the functioning of individuals and groups of individuals and institutions. So that those results gave the value of science. I'll just give one last sentence and stop. Today, when there is a crisis, let's say in dealing with matters of uh, uh, you know, cyber security, for example, or telecom or semiconductors or anything like that, there are groups of people, top scientists and engineers, who the government constantly contacts. These people have, again, through a feedback mechanism, have time and again proven their value in advising on what should be done and what shouldn't be done. The government doesn't look at their publications. They don't care whether they are assistant professors or senior professors. They just, what they advise works. That kind of a feedback mechanism is what will give the value of their institutions. So this value of that institution must be communicated within other arms of the government, i.e. funding agencies that look. It's not your, you know, your top-down metric-driven control, which is of value, but that you produce these kinds of people who are valued in other areas, which is tremendous. And therefore, recalibrate your metrics so that there are more of such people. So these feed metrics cannot be dismissed, but they need to be constantly dynamically recalibrated. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Vijay. I think, I mean, what you're saying is really a distinction between evaluating individuals versus evaluating, uh, you know, inst sort of institutional structures and that, that provide the place where, in where individuals can function more effectively in science. I mean, because in, in some ways, as I, as I had started out doing science, uh, I mean, we do understand the value of measurement. Right and and um, and in fact, you know, it's 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 really bringing back the qualitative um, assessment, as uh, Anna was indicating, that about you know what is this you know human uh, program for a creative endeavor? I mean, how do you how do you bring that into into focus while at the same time being able to able to evaluate it um, somewhat critically? So you know, you know, given that, I I, I just shift to Rahul quickly and ask Rahul, you know, I mean, you had indicated something interesting, which was how does one create a both a, of a top down and a bottom up uh, a way of assessing? I mean, and you, and you, you know, have stated very firmly that you're not part of any of the top, uh, uh, you know, top uh, systems. I mean, you're, of course, a professor. But so what, what would you say in uh, in terms of a, a system that is both top down and bottom up in in this context well um, in terms of a bottom up system, I had in mind something like what various people are working on in the biosciences. I mentioned review Commons, I think there is e life, but basically the idea is to start with preprints and then solicit reviews, keep the reviews in the open. And uh, I believe even in the maths and computer science communities, there are efforts to move towards this kind of a system. In maths, for example, they have these overlay journals where uh, essentially you pick out papers from the archives and uh, from archive.org in, in their case and you know, 
review it and publish it. So that's what a bottom-up system would look like. It would require participation from the broad community of scientists uh, around the world. It, and um, from the point of view of top-down, what I have in mind is that uh, prominent scientists, top labs, should participate in such a system and stop sending their stuff to nature and science and so on. Um, we can't be telling early career researchers not to do it if everybody at the top does it. So the system has to change from senior scientists, from funding agencies, from uh, everywhere. And um, the reason I, you know, so basically it's not happening, uh, not in India and I think not anywhere in the world. So as long as it doesn't happen, early career scientists have to do what they got to do. This is what people look for, at least partially. There was a, an article, I think, in uh, London Review of Books or something like that uh, in 2019. It was a review of, it was a survey of uh, hiring and promotion criteria in, I think, a few dozen US and Canadian universities. And something like 40% of them explicitly mentioned the journal impact factor. Um, as a criterion that they consider, and um, only a small percentage explicitly say that they do not consider such factors. And you know, you're working in the system, uh, you um, don't really have a choice. So that's why I feel, in the context of this meeting, where we're talking to earlier career scientists, um, uh, we can talk about what the environment should be like. But that is not what we live in right now. And uh, from the top down, it has to come from senior scientists. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Rahul. I think that's very insightful. Um, uh, Shahid, I, just, I mean, you know, just speaking from the perspective of the of a funding agency, how easy did you find it uh, to to create an atmosphere where you know the kind of assessments that we are talking about, both top and bottom, uh, uh, you know, are can be put into place. What, what was the, I mean, what was your experience? I mean, what, what did you find? Well, uh, there is a lag phase to these things and that's understandable because people are used to impact factors put out to three decimal places. Uh, but uh, if you persist with it, I think, and if you build an internal culture for it, it works. Uh, so, but let me say that you know, just one uh, India Alliance cannot change the culture. The cultural change has to come from within institutions. The cultural change has to come from all of us who sit on hiring and assessment committees. Uh, unless we do that, uh, you know, that culture is not going to change. Uh, in India, if you see possibly the easiest way to implement this would be to start with DBT, DST, CSIR institutes. If, uh, you know, institutes that give uh, funding agencies that have autonomous institutes that they fund directly, you know, if, if they say this, and you know, I have, I have seen, uh, you know, institutions uh, put out, uh, you know, job advertisement saying, if you don't have five papers above five impact factors, don't even apply to us. Uh, so, you know, that cultural change has to really come from, uh, from institutions, from funders. Uh, otherwise, it won't work. I mean, you can't expect a young researcher uh, to follow it uh, when uh, the whole environment, the whole ecosystem is not doing it. Uh, so. I think that cultural change is very, very important. Yeah, uh, thanks, Shahid. I think that that uh, means there's a long, long road ahead uh, to to effect change. Um, I mean, which is sort of not very surprising in in uh, any of these really tectonic uh, shifts that we need to engage in. Um, so, you know. Um, I, I was just wondering from our, from our uh, colleagues uh, on the panel, uh, you know, there are, I mean, I'm just going to now open it up for the audience because, and, and then, you know, just to give you a heads up that I would like to then come back for, come back to the panelists um, to make their sort of final remarks. Uh, but before, but 
before we do that, I would like to open it up to the quest many questions that we've received from the audience. Um, so I'm, I'm going to uh, read out uh, some of them. Uh, so uh, Amit Patania asks, how, to go, how do you go for encouraging scientific institutions to publish their findings in journals published by them? I'm, I'm not sure what exactly that means, but uh, if any of you on the, on, on the panel want to take that, I think, he's talking about, I think he's talking about institutional journals, such as Indian Institute of Science publishes a journal. Ah, yeah. I think that's what he's talking about. Right, right. So what do you, I mean, what would you think? About Sorry, the what's the question again, uh, Jitu? He's saying, how, how does one uh, go for encouraging a scientific institute to publish their findings in the journal that's published by them. So what, 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 how would you evaluate, I guess, the, the uh, value of such a publication? I mean, it's a very specific question. Yeah. Well, maybe I can take a shot at it. Sure. You know, the, there are um, history of uh, scientific uh, institutions publishing their own journals or annual reports. Uh, and there are two categories, those which are open only to their own um, faculty or staff and those which are open to others. The latter don't succeed unless they have, you know, the backing of a high quality editorial board and referring process and so on and become effectively independent of the institution. The former, which is basically an internal publication, can be of great value because it documents what happens in that institution year after year. Much of Barbara McClintock's research was uh, documented in the annual report of the Carnegie Institution. Uh, and you know, it, that's where she published, end of story. Um, there were other publications, but those were very important. We, I mean, it's, you know, I don't agree that you know, the funding agencies need to change their policies and, and do that. I think that is correct, but I don't agree that that needs to come from quote unquote them. Them is us. I mean, the UGC's policies are made by clones of people sitting here who eventually migrate to UGC. And when sitting there, they suddenly start, in your opinion, doing something strange. And you know, the fact that you all, we all have abrogated our decision-making and our minds to abstract structures called funding agencies is the problem. The funding agency committees who decide on grants are you and me sitting in those panels. Uh, the policies are decided by consultation by you and me too. If we don't participate sufficiently, we get these uh, uh, kinds of situations. So yeah, it, uh, institutional journal is very valuable in its own context and it's a very good repository uh, of what happens within the institution. It has its you know, value, it has to be seen in that context, but it's certainly valuable. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Vijay. <clears throat> so, um, so, so I, 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 an, 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 sorry, another question that's that's come up is is about uh, you know about steps that are being taken to implement DORA in India or elsewhere in a in a coordinated manner. So, I think the concern is, and this has been expressed by several people in the audience, the concern is that if if this implementation is uncoordinated. Uh, the the um, assessment of of individuals are going to be very skewed in the transition period to going to something that is you know that goes from a purely impact assessment to something that's more nuanced. So uh, again, I think I, I will address this question to you, Vijay, and then to Shahid, um, and then get a sense from uh, Anna because she has seen some of these transitions. So, you know, um, three quick points. One, all those here amongst the attendees who have read the DORA declaration before this meeting and gone to their website last, last, uh, yesterday, last week, last month, last year, can you please put up your hands, raise your hand in the raise hand symbol. So that will give an estimate of how much quote, quote, skin in the game we have in these kinds of matters. Uh, I hope it's a significant number. So that's one point. Now, the second issue is that if we look at um, 
you know, the issue of how one can um, get these kinds of decisions implemented on scale. Now, Rahul made a very important point, um, and I think, uh, sorry, uh, Shahid made a point about how funding agencies uh, in their advertisements or institutions in their advertisements ask for impact factor. Now, both the DST and the DBT together, and this was about in 2015 or so, around the time of the Dodd Declaration and maybe a year later, put out a, you know, a note uh, on how to evaluate people and had all the principles of the Dora Declaration essentially outlined over there. Now, that was not imbibed sufficiently widely because for a very simple reason. There is both a reluctance amongst the scientific community in general and a certain sluggishness in actually evaluating each other. Uh, and therefore, they much more easily, rapidly, whether it is awards, promotions, or directorships, sink to these kinds of unconscious metrics or conscious ones very rapidly. So that cultural change will come only when there's a societal demand for real outcomes, as opposed to scientists being ensconced in a bubble where they are their own evaluators of their own navel gazing and decide how well they're doing. You know, have I got this award? Have I got this scholarship? If that's a sole drive of a scientist disconnected with society, then this will breed this kind of a, uh, you know, drift to one end. If there is some demand in a reasonable way from society, not an unreasonable one, it will drift the measure to the other. And the third component is international connectedness. If there is international connectedness in our methods of evaluation, qualitative or quantitative, in a you know, way where solutions have to be there, then it will drift towards um, you know, higher standards uh, rather than isolated standards. But so the challenge is rootedness in our social societal context, yet having excellence over there, and that connect is not difficult to see how it can be done, but we have to be participants in that solution. So how many hands were there? There, I, there were 10, huh? No, I saw 10 at the, okay. <laughs> uh, so 10%, and then uh, we had about four from the panelists, so about 14 out of 120. 10% was the- Not bad, yeah. not bad. Yeah. Yeah. So, I guess you know that increased a little bit. Uh, what? <laughs> what? The numbers increased a little bit about right. Yeah. Yeah. The people were probably checking the website right away. And giving the <laughs> That's great. I love it. <laughs> so, 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 I, I, um, I mean, Anna, maybe Anna, you go first because we, we stopped on the in international uh, engagement uh, point, and then uh, we'll come to Shai about the same question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think. VJ a great point. If possible, aren't enough because you have to have the people and the assessors who implement them. So a big piece of what we've been looking at lately is community engagement. Um, so how do you get sort of the researchers and the academics um, and other individuals at an institution who are doing the evalu evaluating um, to have that group accountability for responsible research assessment? Um, and that all starts with having shared values um, and a shared value system. So, so thinking of that's a challenge, um, there are some, some examples. So, with their university association and spark funds, or sorry, seven institutions and three national initiatives that are implementing responsible assessment practices. Um, so, a couple of the national initiatives that are in there, which I think are relative to this conversation would be the Dutch Recognition and Rewards Program. And that started about two years ago with a position paper called Room for Everyone's Talent. And what this does, what this did was it brought together sort of the national research funders with 
the University Association, the universities in the Netherlands, and I even believe the Royal Academy, to have a discussion about sort of what are our shared values for research assessment and what are our actions together going to be taken over the next few years. And they've turned it into this program where, you know, they recently had a national meeting um, a couple of months ago um, discussing sort of their progress towards a new evaluation system. So it really involves a lot of community engagement um, and group accountability. And they're using the program to hold all of these institutions accountable. Um, the Netherlands is a smaller country. Uh, they have 14 universities. Um, so in much larger countries, it becomes a lot, a lot more difficult. Um, some other examples of national initiatives that are in the case study database are um, the Responsible Research Network Finland. Um, so again, this is another um, national consortia of funders and universities working together to create that ch systemic change, um, as well as University of Norway. Um, there's also an initiative in Latin America called FOLEC. Um, and what's interesting is this is um, going across countries, right? This is now looking at an entire continent. How do you foster change on the continent? Um, and again, sort of they're starting off by just having discussions about um, what do we value in science and what should be evaluated um, so that they can get to like the how can we do this in a responsible way. Um, so that's sort of the international lens that I have for now. Sure. Um, but I can drop some of those links into the chat. Sure, that would be, that'd be great, Anna. So just brief, brief um, uh, comments from uh, Shahid, if you have something to add or? To yeah, this? so I just wanted to highlight one point, and yeah. that is that, uh, you know, assessments are hard to do. They're not easy. And they need committed reviewers. Uh, and then it uh, sort of folds back upon uh, the critical mass for any given area of work within a country. Uh, so if, if you look at India's situation, there are very few fields of research where we actually have a critical mass. So it's the same people again and again who are uh, you know, burdened with reading a lot of material. Uh, so these things are interconnected. Uh, I mean, this cultural change will happen, I think, possibly with uh, increasing critical mass in, in these areas, uh, but also the willingness to do this. If they have to go hand in hand. Right. Um, maybe a reward system of some kind might help, but, um, but you know, we're going to take a couple of questions or, or one, at least one from the audience uh, live. Um, Shreya, would you like to unmute uh, Aditya? Yeah. Go ahead. Aditya, ask your question, please. Go ahead, Aditya. You should be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, uh, I, I think you should be able to hear me now. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, like Dr. Agavan was talking a lot about evaluating using societal opinion or economic impact. So I was just wondering if we use that as a measure, will it not be extremely favored uh, for ex applied research and how do we account for fundamental research in this? Thank you, Aditya. Uh, first yeah. of all, I don't mean that societal impact or economic impact is the only criteria. It's a very important one. And also, I don't think that should be looked at at a fine level of granularity on a you know day-to-day -day basis in evaluating individuals. That is the measure of the value of science and technology investment over a long period to society over a long period. So the time scales of that are very different from what you're asking. In what you're asking, I think that's also a very important point. What value do we place to curiosity, to uh, you know, the joy of doing creative things, uh, whether it's in art or music or physics or mathematics, on doing something applied, uh, doing something in science which is equivalent to quality carpentry, very useful, but routine, training people. There are multiple metrics, uh, multiple components. 
And therefore, we must take a composite view on evaluating that. We are not constantly in this discussion and outside looking for how we can get a magic formula which can tell us whether someone is good or not. There is no such formula. We can look at multiple parameters and we have to take, we have to take a decision. Uh, the chair of a committee or the committee itself needs to be astute to balance all these and take a call and do that at the time of recruitment or promotions and so on. It's not just, you know, uh, papers. There are multiple contributions which people make, which institutions make. An institution which is a very productive, valuable institution must set aside some space for quality people who are not performing by outside metrics, but which the institutional leadership decides these people are valuable. That protection can come only from institutional leadership. It must also equally protect those who are doing purely useful stuff and are not meeting the standards of some you know, artificial measure of academic excellence. And it must, of course, protect those who are academically excellent. That is the job of the conductor of this orchestra, the institutional leadership. It's not easy. So that's, I think, an important point about uh, you know, metrics in general, which I'd like to hopefully convey. Very, very important uh, point. And, and um, here, I think, you know, uh, Rahul, I mean, it may be, uh, you know, just, just in terms of thinking about some of the questions that have, that have been put in the chat. Um, or put in the Q and A. Uh, you know, you you had also uh, brought about some issues concerning, you know, how how do you look at individual science, right? I mean, your your science. I mean, how how does that, uh, you know, how how do you look at your own science, and uh, engage with, with it in in the context of this world of evaluation? I mean, just from a personal perspective. I mean, can you say something? Yeah, well, that's a good question and a tough one. Um, so as you already said, I had one career change during my postdoc years. I more or less switched from condensed matter physics to a form of computational biology, which had really very little to do with physics. And I don't really call myself a physicist anymore. Um, currently I'm going through, so this was more like sequence analysis. Uh, it's more bioinformatics and algorithms, computer science, statistics, uh, things like that. And um, more recently, I've been drifting towards yet another thing, which is machine learning and clinical data. And this is early days yet, but I've already seen, um, we have some interesting projects going on. And so one difficulty is, uh, so one thing that's not a difficulty is getting people excited about it. I tell them, you know, they say, okay, that's very cool. We need this in India. And from the beginning, when I came to India, um, I would like to, you know, mention Vijay, for example, uh, he was one of my earliest collaborators. I was uh, like uh, in the same position as most of the audiences now. Um, Shashi also and a whole bunch of other people who I talked to, collaborated with some, just had good discussions with some. So um, the uh, lesson that I found was that I'm from an institute that people think is a mathematics institute. It is not mathematical sciences, it's all sciences, but you know, when I say where I'm from, oh, how come you do biology there? But that was never a barrier. Um, people want to collaborate. In terms of assessment, I really, I, I'm probably in a kind of sheltered place. I never applied for a job in any other institute afterwards. Um, and uh, so that kind of pressure I have never had. I got this particular job when I was still technically a physicist. And it was based on that. Um, the, I had said that the burden of changing system falls on earlier careers, uh, not on earlier career scientists, but on senior scientists. But um, this person says the stand senior scientists take would affect the junior members. In other words, As a senior scientist, I still hurt the people um, who are uh, working with me as students or postdocs. And I think at some level, it depends on quality of work, things like you know, the pedigree of the lab you come from raised, uh, you know, do affect things. But personal interaction is actually uh, a big factor in all these things. So most institutions 
have required applicants to give seminars and uh, interact with the colleagues and more than where you have published how many papers you've published how many citations you've got uh, i would feel that is actually the biggest impact and if you can actually justify why you published in the journals you did and so on that might actually be a plus so there is a lot to say about this topic i don't want to take up more time and i don't know whether i even answered your question but yeah yeah no i, I yeah no I, I i was also looking to see whether you know how much does motivation and excitement drive your science uh versus assessment um you know uh and i, and I guess you know as, as scientists i mean all, many of us on the panel are are scientists and or have been and uh and you know to be quite honest i think to be able to do science that you are truly and passionately uh, keen about uh you know is a privilege and and i think suffering assessment <laughs> may be the price we have to pay but i think if that first is not there i i don't think it really matters what what assessment one one draws right it's not for the prize that you're doing science i mean if that's i mean anyway that may be, this may be somewhat of a of a you know romantic dream but but i think that's an important one that we should keep in mind um, so anyway, I mean, having said that, I, I think we're getting close to our, uh, you know, our time. I would really like each one of you now to give us some passing thoughts. Uh, I mean, some closing th remarks, uh, so that we can end this and then move to the next session. Um, should we start with you, Anna? Um, if you're there, uh, has Anna? Yes, yes, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um, close. It's always, it's always a challenge to go first because um, you can't rely on the wisdom of everyone who's gone before you. Uh, but I think the recognition that this is a systems challenge and it requires sort of everyone to work together to find a solution. Um, is is hugely important and i also think you know drawing on that, that this idea that sort of everyone can do something um, so everyone has something to give to make the system a better place um, and sort of one thought that i've been balancing lately in my head um, that sort of this the whole sort of discussion sort of has you know danced around so far is the idea that sort of what advances science right now doesn't necessarily advance careers um, and so how do you realign those um, to get to where you want to be um, and is it sort of just having informal discussions with your colleagues that leads to sort of the bottom-up change that gets the attention of the institutional leaders um, who then have the power and authority um, to create change from the top um, so that's 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 sort of my my closing thoughts. <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, Shahid, and I'm going to give Vijay the last word. So Shahid and uh, then Rahul. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I really liked what Anna just said. And, uh, you know, when when I was uh, uh, an early career researcher, I remember we were at a new institution and the culture of the institution was that we would read each other's papers before they went out. We read each other's grant proposals when they went out. Uh, that institution didn't practice that maybe after the first 15 years. And I see that today most institutions don't do that. So that culture that comes internally of working together and helping each other uh, works really well. Uh, the the other is just uh, a piece of information that's uh, sort of laterally linked to the session, and that's about open access. Uh, the University of California and El Xavier have reached an agreement after parting ways for two years, so that all UC system papers will be available open access uh, in El Xavier journals, and this just happened two or three days back. Uh, so that's that's a piece of good news. Thanks, Shahid. I'll stop. Yeah. Rahul, a um, few thoughts, and then we'll get, get some from Vijay. Yeah, I, I 
not sure I have any additional thoughts, uh, but yes, since uh, it is in fact related to the question of open access and open science, which uh, um, I've thought about a bit more than I thought about research assessment. So um, yes, I would say um, it is important to, as uh, Anna also said, uh, document your methods, publish your methods, publish your code. Uh, I mean, so um, it is not just about which paper, which journal your paper goes to, but um, it's about reproducibility and engagement with the scientific community and uh, all those things are kind of important. So how do you decide what paper to read as a regular scientist apart from, you know, the big name journals? Uh, I use Twitter quite a lot. Uh, there are some scientists who really tweet interesting stuff and also, of course, use it for self-promotion. But um, when it's interesting, it gets retweeted and you come to uh, no, you, you see interesting discussions about it before you even read the paper. So I think it's more about uh, in this internet online age, you know, engaging with the broader community and in a way even bypassing journals except as a sort of necessary unit. Thanks. Vijay? You're, you're muted, um, Vijay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, um, since this is a young investigator meeting uh, and there are many young investigators, uh, it'll be good to have a last point which uh, both communicates and reassures them uh, without being platitudinous. See, the very simple point is that if you choose a problem or problems which excite you and work on that, relentlessly, you bring great value to yourself and to your institution. If you add to that the training of people, you bring extraordinary value. Uh, and your science could be judged contemporaneously as being, you know, okay or ordinary and so on and so forth. But the training of people and being very good at something is very, very valuable. That must be the heart of all what we do. And Sidney Brenner says that that can be the greatest contributor, uh, contribution of a scientist, training others. Now, over and above that, you have to navigate the real world. All this will be platitude if you can't survive. And fortunately in India, the, once you get your jobs, the mechanism of staying on is not that difficult. All the problems of funding and everything and lack of resources and equipment and so on are, you know, basically side problems which detract us as being the main ones from our choice of scientific question and how to go about it. Peter Medover famously said that quality equipments which are invaluable for that are best bought by your neighboring labs uh, and not your own lab. Uh, because then they have the hassle of maintaining it, running it, and you use it when you have a question which requires that. Today's world of interconnectedness, you can do any experiment anywhere if you want to manage it, but you're not limited by that substantially. There are limitations. But really, it's your ideas and thought and your global interactions which should drive both your individual training as well as your uh, training of others, which I think think are the main aspects. And there are many, many locations to do that. There are wonderful questions to be asked in biology, which are basic or applied, uh, and we should focus on that. Thanks, uh, Vijay. I, I think, I mean, that was, you know, I think most uh, uh, perceptive and also encouraging. Uh, but also, if you ask me, I, I, I think, uh, you know, re really uh, indicates that if one can have science function in that in this way. Um, you know, I, I think we should have no problem implementing uh, the you know the philosophy behind Dora. So uh, with that, uh, you know, I really encourage every one of you who's listening to sign up also to the to the Dora uh, Declaration and you know work from bottom and top uh, to see that we can you know preserve the fun of doing science as well as uh, it is a valuable activity uh, for the community that we um, uh, we are part of. Okay, so I'm going to close here by thanking all our panelists who have been just really extraordinary, superb, and, you know, providing really uh, uh, extremely valuable thought. This, uh, the questions also were extremely um, 
insightful. Um, they certainly shaped some of um, uh, my thinking. Uh, and this, um, <clears throat> this uh, panel discussion and the, what we've said, uh, if our panelists agree, we'll go uh, you know, on YouTube. Um, they will go, it'll go on YouTube after uh, a, 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 a little, um, you know, editing. Uh, <clears throat> so all the errors that I've had will be edited out, hopefully. Okay, thank you.